it might be nice just to, in a sense, maybe raise a handful of sort of headline points from today's discussions that we might address perhaps in more detail tomorrow, and there is plenty of time for that. And I've got a very long list of things which I won't go through because it'll be tedious for you, but I suppose two points, perhaps rather obvious points, that struck me from, from today's, and this ties in with the issue of mapping. First, the idea of inclusion and exclusion. I mean, that's come up in different ways in all the papers, I think. Who's central, who's at the margins, who's outside. And of course, it affects us as a, as a community and as a network as well. It's impossible to include everybody in a network for the network to, to, to work properly. Um, how people take on multiple roles across communities, going back to Greg's point about Venn diagrams, which I think is, is, is really interesting. How much of that issue of inclusion or exclusion is, is explicit in the rules, I Matt's point about women can't go to these, these dinners even as they're being, as being, they're being toasted, and how much of it is tacit and unspoken, um, and how it might be inflected by, by uh, different identities. Uh, we've talked a lot about, well, or at least alluded a lot to gender and how that, that inflects membership of communities, but also nation as well. So that's one point or set of points. The other one is, is the issue of language. I mean, words like sociable, communal, collaborative, we tend to use rather interchangeably, I know I do, and reading some of the texts um, for, for tomorrow, I noticed that as well. There's a sort of lack of precision, and perhaps that's inevitable given the nature of English. But nonetheless, I think, what would it be like to have a project that tried to make more precise definitions of these terms in relation to cultural production? Um, another word that we'll use was coteries, which has had been used a lot by literary historians recently. Would such a project just be a sort of quixotic thing, something you might find in a Borges uh, short story? Or would it actually be potentially quite useful and valuable to think about um, different forms of group interaction and try and find a, a precise language for talking about them. Um, so they're just two rather large and flabby points, but I'm sure other people have got, have got more precise ones. Anyone? Just on the, on the coterie thing, I think it's a really uh, interesting thing. It's something we tried to do at UCL about a year ago. Look at, uh, I found that words go in and out of fashion Again, fashion being one of those words, but we're coming in and out of fashion so often. And that I, I would talk to a PhD supervisor about, and I'd say that he was in the code <coughs> and he would kind of raise an eyebrow that it wasn't it wasn't the term that he felt comfortable with with, with, with us using. But the code is obviously one example of many of these words that come in and out of, of usage. And so I think precision is might maybe not the way we should look at it. But uh, how how we could possibly track which word's going to be the word that seems possible. You, know, you wouldn't use liminal in a, in a in a journal article now, but I bet if you did a word search for journal articles in the last 15 years, it would come up an awful lot. And how, how on earth do you work out which word is going to be appropriate for Wouldn't you use liminal? Is that... Is that, well, is that <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Zeitgeist was in the... It is the a sort of word you cross out in an essay. Like that, that's that's true, true. Yeah. It was banned at the year. <laughs> but that is, I suppose, that issue of the sort of the fashion of certain ways of. So, um, community is a very uh, fashionable word in uh, humanities at the moment, partly and in social sciences as it always has been, perhaps, but partly because there's a lot of money in the connected communities AHRC research program, and. If you're involved in that research program, there's always the possibility of a, of, a, of a further pot of money at the end of the rainbow once you're sort of in the system. So there are lots of projects at the moment that explicitly I explore different sorts of community, but also the idea of community. But if, if that, a research program was given a bit different title, I mean, it's how institutions work, isn't it? Then, then people will slightly, well, they will change their frame of reference. It won't just be a linguistic thing. It'll actually be a conceptual thing as well. Any other... Jane. I was just thinking about the, the first of our workshops and about religion. I'm thinking it's strange how today I'm sneaking in a question about the Royal Asiatic Society really here, but I'm thinking you can't, presumably it stayed true to its William Jones ethos and wasn't, didn't become a missionary thing after the legislation and whenever it was. And I was wondering, are we saying, to, and we're going to be looking at people dueling and knocking six bells out of each other tomorrow, <laughs> are, are we saying that these things are only creative if we 
keep away from religion. It's just a sort of thing, things to think about tomorrow, really. Or are there, are there any creative societies that are also um, religious, or that is clamping down? I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> more of my debate on the client base, but Matthew Kress did some work on um, Scott was working in London a few years ago and looked at the poll box of the, um, of the churches, the parish churches to find the pew rentals, and was able to find a substantial client base of a sculptor called Henry Cheer who were based around a set of pews in a particular church. <laughs> <laughs> and there are also kind of ways of being able to materially fix some of those kind of relationships. I mean, it sounds to me like it's a lot harder with literary figures than it is with artistic figures, because if you have, I mean, with sculptors, you need a great big yard with lots of places you can put marble and what have you, and you can fix them very clearly to a particular space. But with authors, it seems a far more kind of, I don't know, can you do that with an author and their production? There's a guy, there's a guy um, in Australia, Will Christie, who's um, doing the quarterly review, which we'll talk about tomorrow, but he's taken a list of contributors <coughs> for the quarterly for the first. Well, 30 years or something, 18 or 19, 30, 19, 30, and he's going through and trying to do the Venn diagram, you know, which contributors went to which schools, which contributors belong to which societies, which contributors contributed to the Edinburgh or various other, and it's very, very interesting what he's finding out. Now, one of the things is you, you might think of these people as all sort of committed to the quarter or something like that, but they're far more promiscuous <laughs> than that. Mm -hmm. And so the notion of a stable of contributors starts to break down in quite interesting ways. And you find the quarterly is far more dependent on Oxford and, and Edinburgh than it is on Cambridge. Mm -hmm. That was not much of patronized by the church to some extent. You've got the people, people yes. who are, people, yes. Yes. young men from Oxford write poems reviewed by the quarterly, become quarterly reviewers, get clerical jobs. Right. I'm thinking people like George Crowley and Henry Hart Millman and right. so on. That. So there is a, the, uh, the Anglican Church is still a place where lots of writers will end up. If you don't want to make money by writing, if you want to write, and then use writing as a way to get a good living. Um, so the def definitely the established church has a, has a, has a, has a, sort of a role, role yeah. as, a, as a sort of end point for literary writing. Yeah. Getting, getting a living is still not, not eliminated by this book. John? Yeah, I suppose when the story things up for tomorrow and for the Future, the future workshop. Um, I think I just like. I think I think we could press harder on definitions of the, some of the key terms that we've got, um, rather than I think what we've tended to do is, is assume them to some extent. I mean, you know, what is creative about uh, the Royal Asiatic Society? You know, what what r new definition of cre creativity do we need in terms of collecting? And uh, and designating, classifying, you know, some of those those activities to be taxonomies to be seen as creative in themselves as new ways of looking at things. So I think create. I mean, some of the key words have been so. I mean, London also has been to some large extent uh, assumed in what we've heard today. I think we think we've heard London. Uh, I'm thinking back, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, London has figured <laughs> as far as it's not somewhere else. I mean, in Richard's paper, it was, we heard about Carlyle considering London or Edinburgh as a place in which to make his literary career. Um, we also have heard about uh, London not being Paris in a rather traumatic way. <laughs> um, in some of the other papers, in terms of the institutions, I think we've heard about uh, certain buildings, possibly, certain uh, groups of uh, foreign nationals constituting an aggregation that probably couldn't be found <laughs> anywhere else in the UK but in London. Therefore, there's a kind of material, material wealth and configurations of groupings of people and buildings that mean that London has to be the place in which this thing is founded. I mean, that's precisely why I asked the question about Bristol. Uh, you know, just as, you know, royal, I mean, you know, some of the work I've done on Liverpool, for example, well, the royal institution, the royal Liverpool institution. I mean, Liverpool, in rivaling London, used the word royal for some of its cultural institutions in the late 18th century and early 19th century, just as, you know, it used Pall Mall, Whitechapel, and Vauxhall uh, as place names. So there's the kind of there's a kind of mirroring. So I'm also interested in London, the way in which London 
uh, just doesn't do these things, but is seen to do them and sets up a challenge in other parts of the UK for when we're thinking about our regional examples of community. Um, so the way in which London is, is exemplary and sets off rival, uh, rival communities within Britain more generally, I think we, as we're attending to London, we might think of that potential within what London does itself. Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> 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 <Well>. <laughs> I keep away from creativity. I mean, it seems to me to be replete with romanticism and notions of the individual and the genius and all that. And creative communities is a phrase that you know, it contradicts itself um, as soon as you say it. I, I would suggest that if you just be looking at organizations and institutions, a very useful thing to do would be to take things like the Royal Asiatic Society and the six or ten other institutions that were set up uh, in the 18th and 19th century and look at the aims that they set themselves. And because I think, and there are many in, in Paris and Berlin and elsewhere, because they begin by saying, you know, we are a group of men interested in something, and our aims are to do the following. And they usually are to do with the antiquities, the customs and manners, they usually exclude religion except to some degree of deserve from outside. And I think you find it not just a commonality of organization that, that Matt mentioned, but a, a, a commonality of people coming together you know, to achieve certain knowledge and, and disseminate it. Just to be fair to ourselves, I owe it to us to say that creative communities is self-consciously a provocation. <laughs> we are aware of irony. It's like Muslim feminists. You can't really say it. <laughs> yeah, I w one word that you left off of the list was networks. Mm. And um, that's my project is really interested in networks between institutions and the ways in which one individual can connect up several institutions or the ways in which um, if you follow this lineation through these three institutions, that connects with this person who connects to other institutions, and that sort of transmits back. And so finally, you don't get a circuit, but you get these sort of, um, it's, it's like electricity or something, and it follows certain paths. And um, one of the main networks that I'm interested in is linguistics, because in order to be a good Asiatic uh, scholar, you had to first be a, li a, a polymath in, in languages. That was, th that was the first order of the day. And um, one of the best ways that you could go about this was to do translations of the Bible. So you get the religion it is this more general, vague thing, um, because missionaries would go out, learn the language, translate the Bible, but then enter that language into the into the uh, body of knowledge of languages that Western scholars could command. So the figure I'm studying, um, he keeps copying these long lists of all the languages that the Bible Society, um, all the languages that it's, pr it's published translations of the Bible in where it was published and who translated it. And so sometimes they're scholars, sometimes they're missionaries, sometimes their um, priests or ministers or whatever who, who are you know, living wherever uh, to learn the language and to propagate their faith. And, and they're not all Christian. It's all these various religions. Um, and so, we, so I'm wondering if networks, um, so a linguistic network, a, a, a missionary network, which is not the same as a religious network, you know, if there are ways to to connect these, uh, these to broaden the definition of what a community is, and that it doesn't have to be people that meet together so, so often or pay their subscription or whatever, but but they're they're this um, more um, uh, sort of like their version of the internet. Yeah, it's it's that issue of diffusion, isn't it? Um, probably the last. Point from Greg. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the, the kind of counter to that, maybe this is an attempt to make it, to metropolitanize it a bit, although it would be also true of you know, other cities like Liverpool, is you know, to think again about that Bourdieu model, his great reading of sentimental education, where he, in a way, describes Paris in the mid century as being a bit like a board game. We inject all these young men into it, as it turns out, and they, they have to make their choices. And I suppose one way of thinking about <coughs> these communities in London in this period is. Yes, there are lots, but you know, what are you going to do with your Tuesday night? Is it the <laughs> Royal Asiatic Society or is it some other? But you know, you're already making choices that are necessarily kind of, you know, sort of mutually exclusive, perhaps, or that you can't do everything. Um, I mean, free radicals like sort of Crab Robertson is quite interesting because he's just, you know, am I going to go to Lambs this evening or am I going to go to Mrs. Barbells? And there, are, t to a degree, you can straddle these different. Um, spaces and that makes him such an interesting figure but there are also ways in which you might in the end be you know that Bourdieu's model is, is essentially magnetic in the end isn't it that you're being kind of pulled in different directions and that ultimately your career and your identity as an individual is going to be determined perhaps by these choices that you make and you can't you can't make, remain free forever so I wonder whether that's also kind of that what that might be what distinguishes say the metropolis from all except other big cities. It's just that the sense that you've got a choice in the end, but that you're, you, know, you might live or die by your choice by going to the one dinner. <laughs> well, that's a good point at which to finish, because you have no choice. <laughs> 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 the way you're going to die. You know, something we don't. <laughs> 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 so you're uh, thanks, thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>